you know, you're in an enlightenment community. You're not in a psychological community. Mm -hmm. Do you remember he said that? Mm -hmm. And also along the way, one or two people were uh, kind of wanting to be psychological, you could say, like uh, Prema wants to talk about the fact when she was born, she had to stay in the hospital when she was only two months old or one month old, or five minutes old actually, in her case, five minutes old. You know? So after, after, I don't know, 41 years and five minutes, she's still talking about what happened in the first five minutes. And he basically said, you know, forget it. You know? So, you know, with, I've had to suffer Raj for 15 years worrying about his fear, you know. And he allows his fear to completely sabotage his whole life. And there's no way to get through to him. And I hope, Raj, today will be the day when you really get it, what he said. You know? And I think everybody else should also get it, you know, that this is not a psychological community. So I can only trust my intuition. I can only trust my connection to the divine intelligence. And most of the time, I would say 95% of the time, I absolutely trust that. And I've been trusting it since 25 years now, actually. And maybe my whole life when I didn't know about it. So, you know, if you have any questions about how to live your life, just trust the messages, the in inner messages you get. That's your best bet. Best bet, trust the inner messages, even when they seem to be like crazy, like, do you remember the story about the man who was jumping in the river? Do you remember that story? And then he was picked out by a fisherman and blah, 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 you know. So you won't always get messages that seem to fit comfortably into your story, into the, your idea of your story, you know. <clears throat> because we're sort of more humble, you can say, I would say, or more ordinary. But it seems to me that what he talks about, like I said, is exactly what's happening here. For example, Kieran is worrying about his bullshit, but actually, you know, he got Trapelia together when he was there. He, he set it on a good, good way, I, I would say. Now he's managed to find a way to communicate to Ram, which is almost impossible, as we all know. And he can communicate through Russian to VJ. And now the Russian man and the French man and the German man are working all night to finish the bathroom together. And this is kind of a miracle, actually. And we're doing these kind of miracles every day in this community. It's fucking brilliant, you know. You have to see how fucking brilliant it is. Because this... This brilliance is happening from each one of everybody, you know. It's not, nobody is higher and nobody is lower, you know. It's like together, it's like a, like I said, it's like an anthill or it's like a beehive, you know. We're like a beehive or an anthill, you know. It's some sort of organism, you know. And it all works together, you know. And, and you, you should try to see it like that, because when you see it like that, then you won't be so much caring about his fucking stupid stuff, or his stupid stuff, or her stupid stuff. You, know? you just won't care about it anymore, because it's such, such a low level compared to what we're actually aspiring to every day in this community. If you want to dwell on the fact that, you know, in the first five minutes of your life you were put in a plastic uh, box and your mother couldn't cuddle you for two months and then when she did cuddle you, she couldn't really cuddle you because she was the kind of woman who can't cuddle anybody, you know. And if you want to hold on to that story for 45 years, don't, you know, it's just completely not the way to live your life. Please. And having said all that, sometimes it's useful to go to the human university, in, in Govinda's case, to try to break some kind of very solid, mindy stuff or something. So there is value in sometimes doing some kind of inner engineering or something, something like inner engineering, you know, on a particular thing maybe. 
So there is also value. I'm not discrediting all value. You know? And of course it has a value too. You know, I'm not saying that therapy doesn't have some value. But it doesn't have much value if you really want to live in freedom. Because to live in freedom, you just live in freedom. You know, you cook your, cook your food, you bang your drum, and you do complicated computer stuff. You know, you just do what is your thing. And that's all you have to do. Yes, Ra Raj is the one who locks the door at night. He's the one that does all kind of invisible stuff all day long. He's, he's always got his nose on the grindstone doing some thing that nobody else notices, actually. So he's actually a very important part of the anthill because he kind of picks up all the things that everybody else doesn't pick up or something like that. You see, because, you know, cleaning up the, the meal times or cleaning the floors or caring for the kids or the animals or whatever, all the things we do here all the time, which you can just call ordinary life, is also a spiritual practice. I mean, if you think when you're washing the dishes that's not a spiritual practice, then you don't understand what a spiritual practice is about. So everything we're doing in this community is a spiritual practice. If you, if you, I mean, very often when volunteers come here, they see us running around working a lot, and they make a judgment, oh, it's not very spiritual here. You're not really spiritual because you don't walk around, you know, in silence with your nose in the air being superior or something. We're just running around doing what's our tasks, yeah? But this is, it's, this is an enormously spiritual life you're doing here. I mean, if we put on, you know, white gowns or something, you know, and had little hats, then we would look like an amazing kind of monastery. <laughs> You know, but because we dress in an ordinary way and whatever, then we don't look very spiritual. Paul Bacti has the trouble here. She can't believe, you know, what's going on here because we look so ordinary. And John David doesn't have a long beard and he doesn't wear a gown and he hasn't got a Rolls Royce. So Paul Bacti has terrible trouble here. You see. Now she has less trouble, but she's, it's taken her quite a while to get through her ideas about how spiritual is, you know. I was reading a story last night, so, so um, somebody we know very well, a, a Russian girl, you know, she used to live in Siberia, and she had a very strong, um, how can I say, she, she knew she was going to meet her master, she knew it, she kind of had a picture of her master, and she managed to get herself from Siberia without any money to Moscow. And she had this very strong inner clarity about meeting the master. So in Moscow, amazingly, she met somebody, actually somebody I know, who had a spare ticket to India. Now, he probably didn't have a spare ticket, but he probably decided she deserved the ticket. So he bought, bought her a ticket, or he had a ticket, and she flew to India. And this man was thinking that Osho would be the master. Yeah? And when she came to the ashram, she realized for herself, it's not the, this is not my master. Anyway, I think he'd already left the body by then. So she realized it's not the master. And then somebody, she met somebody who said, probably your master is in luck now. So then she came to luck now. She arrived there with no money. She couldn't speak English. And she was pretty young. I, I don't know. Anyway, Papaji immediately said to her, um, I was waiting for you. Oh, no. Now I'm going to cry. <sighs> anyway, you can read in the book what happened to her there. But one beautiful thing was after many years, she was living in Papaji's house and she was working in a restaurant. So she, she would see Papaji in the morning at breakfast, and then she'd go out to work, and she'd come back at 9 o'clock in the evening. And guess what? Papaji was every night waiting for her with dinner. Can you imagine that? So all your ideas about spiritual is not spiritual. 
see. But I'm much more impressed with the fact that, that, that Papaji understood that this woman is really an amazing human being. And he was sitting there, you know, he was 85 or something. And he was sitting at 9 o'clock or, I don't know, 10 o'clock at night, waiting for her to come home and giving her, well, saying, here's your dinner, you know, here's your dinner. I just heated it up or somebody just heated it up for you. Every night. This is what it's about, you see. That's why I'm crying. So drop your ideas, you know. If you have any ideas about how spiritual should be, just drop it, because it's all nonsense. There isn't any spiritual life. There's only fucking life, you know. Fucking life, which you can lead it in a, in a more aware way. You can be, have some awareness about your life. But there is not some sort of special section called spiritual life. I remember years ago I was a Reiki master. When I first left India and came to Australia, the only thing that I could make some money was teaching Reiki. So I was a Reiki master, so I was teaching Reiki. And you know, the Reiki people, such a bullshit, they talk about Reiki energy as if it's a sort of special pipeline of special Reiki energy that they can bring to you, right? I always thought, well, this is fucking stupid, you know, how can it be like that? So there are so many bullshits in the spiritual world. You have to really look through this bullshit. So play your music, cook your food, and do your computer stuff. And that's, that's how it goes, you know? That's how it goes, every day together. And we create incredible field of love in this house. So you have to listen to what you're being told by this divine intelligence. It's funny because I would never, until we made this film of my life and put all these things in it, I would never have said that I'm following the design, divine intelligence, you know? I would never have dared to say that, actually. But actually, more and more I see, actually, that's exactly how I lead my life, you know? For example, I, I, yesterday I had a date with Ram Sharan, you know, the guy, we, we meet him often in India. And uh, he went to the beach and wasn't on our thing. When he wasn't there at 11 o'clock, I knew he'd probably be on the beach. And sure enough, he <laughs> forgot and went to the beach. Yeah? He's in Portugal now. So maybe in the next days, I'll have another talk with him. Yeah? I'm not interested in his stories because I've already got a book full of his stories because he's in two of my books and where he told all, all his Papaji stories. I've got all his stories, right? But I wanted to, to do a Zoom with him because I want him to invite him to do one of these meetings, yeah? Because I've thought for years, why are you not a satsang teacher? Why don't you share with people? And I don't know exactly what it is, but he, somehow he can't get started. And so my whole idea was to get him started <laughs> with doing a meeting with us, you know, where he could play a bit of um, his harmonium and sing a bit, and then he could answer your questions. And maybe this would kind of get him on the way, you know? Because he's a, tr a tr tremendously amazing guy. I think you all know that. Yeah? So somehow one of my roles is to support what I can, you know, like now with Ram Charan. You know? It's somehow been one of my uh, tasks, you can say. And I don't know if you all know this, but from now, or I think she's done two meetings already, but from now on, Indira is going to start sharing from herself, which will, of course, be different from the way John David does it. Um, so this is also, I think, an interesting moment that there's another person now who can start sharing. And the people in Trapelia, they got absolutely pissed off that I was not going to do the meeting with them and that Indira was going to do it. And I told them to piss off. <laughs> and then uh, now, they, now they had a meeting with her and they completely enjoyed it, of course. <laughs> so now she's doing another one in a couple of weeks and they haven't said anything this time because they know it'll be a nice meeting. <laughs> So, you know, I, I think it was, Kiran was very caught up in this idea of acceptance, you know, 
And Andrew was saying, well, you have to be careful because there's lots of bullshit around which you shouldn't accept. You know, for example, for me, this guy Trump, he's a fucking disaster. And he's been a fucking disaster for four years. And I was, I just couldn't wait for this election. You know, I, every night until two in the morning, I was watching this whole th drama unfold, you know. I, I don't know if you know anything about it, but I mean, in the end of the end, this guy Trump, he even set thousands of people marching on the parliament to stop them voting for the new president. Unbelievable shit he did. He's an absolute dangerous guy, an absolutely horrible, dangerous guy. And finally, he's been defeated, you know. The, 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 he got more votes in the election, Trump got more votes than anybody ever got before in the American elections, right? So he should have won. But the other guy, he got even more because people, masses of people went out to vote who would never have voted because they all wanted to get rid of this nightmare Trump, right? So sometimes you can't accept, you know, sometimes you have to be fucking pissed off. I've been pissed off about Trump's, well, even before he was the president because he's a complete shitty human being. Dangerous, dangerous. And he had no honor inside, you know, no basic human honor. Do you know the story of this guy who was uh, cut up into pieces in the, in the Turkish embassy? In, yeah, you know that story? There, w there was a man from Saudi Arabia, a journalist, who'd been writing things against what's going on in Saudi Arabia, because a lot of horrible shit goes on in Saudi Arabia. Anyway, and he'd been writing against it, and he wanted to marry somebody, so he had to go to the embassy to get some document in order to get married, right? So he had checked out whether it would be safe for him to go there with some very important guy. Actually, he was the ambassador, Saudi Arabian ambassador in, in America. He, he asked him, is it going to be okay if I go to the embassy? It'll be all right? And he was told, yes, it'll be all right, you see? And then when he got there, they jumped on him, gave him some very strong drug and killed him. And then they cut him up into pieces, put him in a bag, and they never found what, where, where they threw this bag. Yeah? And there was a hit team that came in a private jet from Saudi Arabia. And there was a doctor who came with a saw, already a saw, you know, to cut him up. So it was completely pre-planned. And the Turkish government was bugging the, the embassy. So they heard the whole story going on. They have a tape, you know, with the whole story of what happened to this guy in the embassy, right? So there is, in, in Saudi Arabia, I'm sorry to rant on about this, but this is where you can't always accept everything. So this uh, situation in Saudi Arabia, the king is 86 years old and very sick and can't really function. So for some reason, he's chosen a young guy who's about 35, and he's basically running Saudi Arabia. He makes the final decisions, right? And um, so Trump didn't want to, to blame this young guy for killing this man. Everybody could understand, well, I could understand, that this young guy who is the prince, with the, his father is the king, that he had ordered this uh, killing. Yeah? It was obvious that he'd ordered the killing. But anyway, he said he didn't. And Trump accepted that he didn't, because Trump wanted to sell lots of stuff to Saudi Arabia. He's been supplying arms to Saudi Arabia. And of course, Saudi Arabia buys a lot of American farm products. So this is good for Trump, because then he gets the votes of the farmers. Yeah? So this is how Trump's mind works. So now the new president, right? this week, he telephoned to Saudi Arabia, and he refused to talk to the prince. He only talked to the king, right? Which is probably not so good for America, actually. But anyway, he, 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 he's an honorable man. And so now the government of America has brought out a Secret Service report, which exactly says the prince ordered the killing, which anyway has been obvious for years. Yeah? So that's the kind of man Trump was, you see? that he would not honor that because he wanted to do business with Saudi Arabia. 
and of course some personal business too probably. So you can't accept everything, you know. For example, the cl uh, uh, this climate change thing, you see. Again, Trump completely denied there was any climate change. He came out of the organization about climate change. He took America out of it. The first thing this other president has done on his very first day is put America back into that, right? Because the reality is that unless we get to grips with climate change like now, we're all fucked. The human race is fucked. There's a good chance we will completely annihilate ourselves. So it's a super urgent thing. And Trump, in his complete, uh, what's the word? He's com well, he's a criminal, basically. He's completely crim criminal mind. He was denying climate change, you see. Completely dangerous guy. So you can't accept everything. You have to get pissed off. You have to get really angry. You have to do something about it. And I don't know if you understand this, but you know, what we're doing about it in this community is about the best thing that anybody can do about all this stuff. Because you have to become more conscious. And this community is about becoming more conscious. And of course that makes John David a weird guy, you know, but I don't care being, I've always been a weird guy, actually. I never could accept lots of stuff because it's so obvious. If you're, if you're conscious enough, you c I can see what's going on with Trump's mind, you know, even from here. I never met him, but it's obvious what's going on with him. I mean, I could go on about all that stuff because, you know. Oh. Sorry. I'm not sorry, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's my Englishness, you know, saying sorry. I'm not, I'm not, fucking, not fucking sorry. I'm absolutely not sorry. Anyway, I, I was touched from Andrew saying that our school was a good idea. Because this school, if we can pull it off, is more than a good idea. You know, it's a fucking brilliant idea. The idea that kids can grow up in a creative environment where there's lots of love and they're not expected to follow any kind of uh, predetermined idea about whether they're good or not. You know? oh. And I'm, I mean, I'm so touched that existence has brought me these two little girls, you know, because I, I wouldn't have had this passion to make a school without them, actually because it's not going to be so easy to get it all together. I mean, it's a big project, actually. And, you know, unfortunately, there may not be so many kids ready to come to this school. Parents are so brainwashed, they won't realize the possibility of it. Like this week, I tried to invite four kids from the kindergarten where the girls go now, right? Uh, and none of them even answered. I sent them an email with this beautiful kids film in it. They didn't even answer. Because they're all full of fear also. Yeah, they're all fear of the, of the yeah, virus. Missing something wrong, missing something. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. The whole world's living in fear. And why is it living in fear? Because the governments deliberately, the politicians and the priests, want us to live in fear. You need to understand what goes on at a high level between the priests and the politicians. They're in the same game to keep everybody in fear. So don't let them keep you in fear. Have the guts to stand up against this. Did you know what happened in Russia? For many years, the communists, one of the good things the communists did was they closed all the churches and all the cathedrals and stuff. They all closed. They were using them for storage or I don't know what they used them for. And the main cathedral in the whole of Russia, right, they demolished it. It was in Moscow. They demolished it. Right? So they made a very strong statement, the communists, we're not having any of this religious bullshit. We demolished the, the main cathedral. Right? And what did Putin do when he became president? One of the first things he did was to rebuild that cathedral. You see? That has an enormous me meaning, if you understand what I'm saying. So... Acceptance isn't like you think. You know. 
and also acceptance within yourself is of course important you know self acceptance so anybody like to respond to my angry uh, passionate outburst Yeah, but you have to do enough meditation so you know it's coming from the divine intelligence. And, I mean, you know enough about your mind uh, and its patterns to know when it's the mind, I think. It's not really that difficult to, to know the difference. It's, it's more difficult to trust the message. I would say to, to the last part you mentioned. So for myself, I studied politics for five years at the university. And I can see that it was really about, about understanding these structures and in some way, through this understanding, also be more able to free myself from this authority. You're talking about uh, the religious and the political authority. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a nightmare. I mean, humanity is completely locked into that, you know. For example, and a good example of this, you know, is in England. So about four years ago, they voted to leave the common market, right? And the two guys who were leading the campaign to leave, right, they didn't believe they were going to win, right? So on the morning when they announced the results, they were like sleeping or whatever, I don't know. Anyway, they were completely not ready to kind of stand in the public and say, wow, we won, this is a great moment for England. You know, they, they, the, 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 mo the motive of getting out of the common market in the end from one of those two guys was that he wanted to be the prime minister, right? And now he is the prime minister. So in a way, he completely sold out the whole country in order to become the prime minister. So what kind of guy is that? And I mean, from my position, um, it, what they've decided to go out of the common market is the most stupid political decision that England could make. It's a historical fuck up, you can say. Complete historical fuck up. And the young people in England, they were completely upset by this decision. So the young people didn't want to leave, and the old people wanted to leave. Why did the old people want to leave? Because they have the idea of Great Britain, you know? Waving the flag, you know, we won the war and all this bullshit. It's a, it's a big tragic thing, and it happened because this guy wanted to be the Prime Minister. So this is the level of these politicians. They're all crooks, actually. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, I started working in politics after my degree, but I could really quickly realize that I couldn't do it because it's something about this game that they, it didn't speak to me. And then I, that's how I became a school teacher instead. Because I yeah, and if now you get this school together, you know, look what an enormous contribution you'll, you'll have made. Because if we can really get this school together and we can really show the possibility of bringing up kids in kind of freedom, in love, in creativity, I mean, this is an enormous contribution because uh, uh, people don't understand, actually. They don't understand. What is being done to kids in schools is, is, a, is a crime, actually. Crime against humanity. And in a way, I'm also amazed when I look at my two little girls, yeah? They're so different, you know? One of them could probably do very well in a normal school, and, but the other one would be completely crucified in a, a normal school. Yeah, for so many parents, they realize that the normal school structure is not so good for the kids, but there's just not enough courage to, to do it differently. Yeah, and also there's not enough choices, because where do you go, you know? There's very few places who, I mean, like we've started talking recently about some alternative schools, you know, Bialte started talking, yeah? And I mean, I haven't been there, so maybe when, if I would go there, I'd have a different opinion, but the kind of school where it, it doesn't give kids any advices about what they could do, I find this really stupid. 
is also stupid, you know, in the other way of, you know, too much freedom. Because actually kids love to learn, and if you say, look at this music instrument, you, you could play this, you know, you know, one of these funny things, you know, it goes round and round and you blow it at one end. I mean, you've got to give kids many chances, yeah? You can dance like this, you know, you can paint like that. I mean, if, have you seen my two girls' paintings? Oh, they're so different. And Ni Naomi pl paints these funny people. Have you seen her people? They're c like little stick arms and legs. She starts painting them from the feet. She does the feet, then she does the legs, and then she does a body, and then she does arms, and it's very strange figures. And then she does really cute faces. Yeah? And Naomi, uh, Amelia, she gets a color, and she goes like this. You know? And she does a completely energetic painting. And if it was better quality on a canvas, we probably could sell them for a lot of money, actually. Because, <laughs> you know, there are famous painters doing that style. You know? So they're completely different human beings, you know. And so how I managed to turn up with having two little girls who are so different, I mean, it's a fucking miracle, actually. It reminds me all of um, Elon Musk. Because what? Was, what? It reminds me of the story of Elon Musk. Yeah. You know, Musk was once asked, like, what do people need to come to Tesla? And then Elon Musk says something like, hopefully you dropped out of college and did something exceptional from yourself. <laughs> you have a chance. If you, if you manage college, then you don't have a chance anymore. Right, right, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And look at himself, you know, he, he made himself a billionaire when he was still in his 20s. From, he started PayPal, you know, this... He, he was working in a bank. His story is, you should read the book of his life, it's, a, it's an inspiration. He was working in an ordinary bank, right? And he thought, why don't you do all this through the internet, you know? And so he went to the bosses of his bank and said, look, you know, why don't we could start up a, another kind of bank? And they were like, no, 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 we don't do that. You know, we use checkbooks and you write on the checkbook and all that, you know. Nobody would listen to him. So he started his own bank and became a billionaire when he was 20, in his 20s. And then he, I don't know the whole story, but then he used that money to start Tesla. And for the first years, like Amazon, he didn't make any money. He was, it was, uh, he was losing money for years. Not just a bit of money, but billions. And now they've started to make a profit. And I think now either Apple or Tesla are the most rich com com uh, companies in the world. You know? Tesla. You know? One day it's Tesla, the other day it's Amazon, the other day it's Apple. It just depends <laughs> who gets up in the morning and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this guy, he, 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 you have to read his life story, you know. I mean, he's an exceptional human being. I mean, the other thing he does is that he decided to get involved in rockets, right? Because he has this idea to start a community on Mars. You could say, well, well this is a really loony idea, yeah? But anyway, he put a rocket company together. And normally, before him, every rocket that goes up, right, doesn't come back down. So you, you spend a lot of money building the rocket, which you can never use again. So he had a very simple idea. Why don't we get these rockets back down and we can use them again? Right? Very simple idea, but not so easy to do it. But anyway, he invented some little legs that come out, you know. So the rocket goes up and then it starts coming down and it has little legs that go out and then it has a parachute or, or something, I don't know. Maybe it's some rocket motors. And it comes down and it just lands. Amazing. So that cut the cost of rockets, I don't know, by half or less than half even. So now he's, his company is getting constantly, um, what's the word, um, contracts, yeah, to send people up to the space station, right? So his company became incredibly successful, basically out of this idea, why don't we bring the rockets back down and use them again? So he's a brilliant guy because he has these crazy ideas, you know, which are not, not actually crazy.
But, you know, can you imagine he, he was the first guy to start a company with rockets that can be reused? You see? And I bet you all the other engineers and so on he met, they all said, oh, no, no, it's not possible. No, completely not possible. No. So he absolutely, as you say, he had to find people who hadn't been successful in school, who weren't successful in, in other rocket companies, but he had to find, like, like Steve Jobs talked about, he had to find the misfits, the guys who didn't fit, you see, because those are the guys who could maybe make a rocket come down and land on, you know, blah, blah, blah. So please be inspired from what I'm talking, and for yourself, just go crazy and do your life. And don't care about whether it's acceptable or not. You know? And don't care about what she was caring about. You know? She's been writing the same shit to me for years. And I keep telling her, shit, boring. Just get your heart open and start living your life and stop postponing. She never wants to listen to that. <laughs>